morning, everybody. <laughs> so I am Amy Wyant. I'm the executive director of the Acuto County Conservation Association. And you will probably know me more as the tech director for all these wonderful Watershed Wednesdays. Um, if you have questions, like I said before, make sure you use the Q&A button. Um, there's also a chat and you have the raise hand feature. So uh, we have the option at the end once our presenter has finished that we can open up your microphone and you can ask your question uh, verbally if you'd like. So keep that active and uh, if you have any questions at all, you can always chat me, you know, technical questions um, during the presentation, chat me while we're at it. But I'm going to turn it over to Emily to, uh, to get everything started. Thanks, Amy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining today. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first week of the 2022 Watershed Wednesday series. I'm Emily D. Carr. I'm the Agricultural Coordinator for the Upper Susquehanna Coalition. So Watershed Wednesdays are hosted by the Upper Susquehanna Coalition and the Otsego County Conservation Association, like Amy had mentioned. We started holding Watershed Wednesday sessions back in 2020 to take the place of the annual Watershed Forum when we couldn't meet in person. And since they were so successful, we decided to continue them. So this is our third year doing them. We will be holding sessions every Wednesday from now until, Oct I'm sorry, November 2nd. The full schedule is posted on our website and Facebook page. You can also sign up for email announcements on the USC website under the Watershed Wednesday tab. So you'll get automated emails on Monday prior to and then uh, Wednesday morning, a couple hours before the session starts as well. So to get things started this morning, our presenter is Kevin Brown. Kevin was born and raised on a dairy farm in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. He attended Alfred State College. He worked previously for Agway and Cargill, selling feed and assisting farmers with crop needs. After 22 years of sales, Kevin joined the Bradford County Conservation District as an ag technician and is now the ag team leader. So Kevin's going to give you an overview of no-till gardening, gardening the easy way. I'll hand it over to you, Kevin. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So yeah, so I've been in the uh, the dairy world all my life. I'm working with uh, nutrient management here. And so maybe it seems a little strange that I ended up with uh, getting into gardening. So just really quick, uh, how did I get here? And if you look under the, the title, um, I'm the first to tell you that I'm not a gardener. Uh, I've never been a gardener. and it's too much work for me, so um, I'll explain how I got here, and then we can we can go in with some questions. Um, I got here because I work with farmers, and in Pennsylvania, at least in Bradford County, we have promoted no-till and cover crops uh, very heavily for for quite some time now, and a lot of that has to do with soil health benefits. One of my other jobs was also going to the local schools and talking with uh, kids anywhere from uh, third grade up to sixth or seventh grade. And because farmers now are like 1% of the population, uh, I was having a hard time making the connection between soil health and growing crops and, and why soil health matters to non-farmers alike. So one day when I was talking to them, I, I kind of asked how many of them had gardens? And of course, a majority of them raised their hand. I never heard of no-till gardening. I didn't know it existed. I didn't know that it even worked. But I started thinking, well, if it works for commercial agriculture, why would it not work for the general population? Uh, and so I started doing a little research. I found a mentor that lived locally in the community that has been doing this for quite a while. And the kind of the whole thing kind of uh sprouted legs and, and, and took on a life of its own at that point in time. And, and it's just snowballed since then. Um, so that, that's how I kind of got to this point. So, you know, if we till soil, whether we're tilling it with plows and discs for commercial ag, or whether we are running a rototiller through it, you know, we pulverize that soil. Uh, once we pulverize it, the rain start coming, you know, the first rain kind of seals the top off maybe wets a fair amount of the soil, compacts it a little bit. The next rain does the same thing. By the time the third rain comes, and I have a video here later in the presentation to show you, um, things have gotten pretty well sealed off. And, uh, it, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot. I'm assuming you can see the cursor if I move around, but there's not a whole lot of water 
that is going to infiltrate down through this. It's very platy. There's just not a lot of ways for water to get down through this. And so a lot of times the water, unless we get a lot of it, is just not going where we want it to go. You know, this is more like what we want. Um, there's a lot of roots in there. There's a lot of structure. Uh, there's many ways for water to get down through the soil and, and get to where we want it to go. So I started in with no-till gardening. Um, so because you don't till, uh, there's no rock picking. There's obviously no tilling. There's no weeding. And until this year, I would have told you there's no watering. <laughs> uh, we were extremely dry this year. And at home, I did some watering with a garden I had at work. I did not do any watering um, just because, again, I'm, I'm not a real gardener I, and I don't want to put a lot of work into it. So I just left it out there to see what would happen to it. Uh, it turned out reasonably well for the most part. Um, but basically, with no-till gardening, you're just going to plant it, you're going to harvest it, and you're going to mulch it for the following year. That's, that's basically all you're going to do. So it's extremely easy to do. Uh, what are your goals? So different people have different goals. Um, you know, my goal for this, and I'm not going to read directly off of it because it bothers me when people have a slide up and they can read it themselves and, and then the pre presenter just reads it to you. So to paraphrase, to paraphrase, the goal for my project was just to show two things, uh, that we can improve soil health, which is a huge thing that, that we're really promoting doing. And also just to show that you can do a garden and put very little work into it and still have a really nice garden at the end of the year. Um, again, I, I'm just not, I'm not a big gardener. So if you're a person that takes pride in having the quintessential garden, you know, you want perfect rows, you, you want, you know, nice bare soil in between them. Maybe you want to spend time out there because it's relaxing, pulling weeds. Um, Lord knows why you'd want to do that, but, <laughs> but, but some people do. Uh, you know, maybe you want to get away from, you know, the the spouse, the children, the whatever, and it's your quiet time. If, if that's you, uh, you know, sign off and, and don't listen to anything else I have to say, because, you know, that's not what you're getting here. Um, you know, I've heard no-till described even on a, a commercial setting as being messy or dirty at times. Uh, if that look bothers you, you know, if, if not having that quintessential garden bothers you, again, this is not for you. Um, I've been told that the only creature on earth likes things tidy are humans. And, and that is correct. You know, everything else needs to have places to, uh, um, to have shelter, to have water, to have food, to have all these things and, and bare, bare soil does, does not do that. Is your goal the environment? Do you want to do what's best for the environment? You know, as a mother nature, as a healthier soil, you know, healthier soils, they're starting to prove produce healthier plants. If they're healthier plants, we're going to have healthier food. So we're going to be healthier. So, so that's a good goal. If that's your goal, then this, this will work really well for you. Um, and if your goal is like me and I want to have some fresh garden vegetables, but I really don't want to do anything to, to get to that point, uh, you know, this, this also works. Uh, when we till, we destroy everything. Um, just imagine a category four hurricane coming through your local community. Uh, when that tiller comes through or that plow comes through and you're kind of just getting things all kind of back together again and bam, here it comes again and it and, and just crushes you again. Eventually, all that soil health, if you didn't kill it while you were tilling it, they're, they're going to leave because they've just had enough and, and they don't want anything to do with that kind of soil. So the pillars of soil health, keep it covered, keep a living thing growing in it uh, all the time. Diversity and do not disturb. Uh, we need oil, organic matter. We need structure. We need all those things. So if this is your garden. If this is the way you want your garden to look, uh, that's not what it's going to be. So the first year that we did this, I was debating about doing it at work or not. Um, you can see by the top of the slide that about June 19th, my boss came to me and said, hey, we've got an intern coming in and they're going to help you plant this garden. And I thought, wow, we're starting way behind but the eight ball, but uh, I guess we'll we'll do it and see what happens. So we had a lawn. We threw a bunch of hay on top of it. We planted plants in it. I've got some other pictures here later, but you can see the rows of plants. So we planted peppers and tomatoes and a bunch of collards and, and different things. Um, another picture of it. 
little closer. You know, a bunch of peppers. Uh, again, uh, again, I'm not a gardener. I'm assuming they're, you know, different collards. There's some, uh, and I could have that terminology wrong, but some uh, lettuce and some uh, cabbage. You know, midway through the season, this is what we had. Uh, again, and we're not we're not doing anything as far as watering, weeding, anything goes. And, and this is what we have: some tomatoes. We have tried different ways of tying them up, which nothing's really worked. The end of the year, this is kind of what we had. Some pretty good rows down through the middle. Um, I think these flowers, I believe, came in on their own. Um, I'll, I'll talk about weeds here in just a minute, whether you call that a weed or not. I'm not really sure. I guess that depends on the person. Uh, the following year, same thing. Again, if you get really picky, I'm guessing this is probably a weed. There's a little bit of grass here. Does that make any difference? Depends on the person. The third year, uh, we had a woodchuck or something getting in here. It was, was pretty well cleaning the leaves off this thing. Um, but again, this is a garden that's at work. You know, there's 16 hours a day that there isn't a soul around anywhere. Uh, so we've tried different fences and stuff to keep things out. But, uh, you know, sometimes we're successful. Sometimes we aren't. Again, you can see a weed or two here and there. It uh, doesn't bother me. It doesn't hurt the growth of the plants. So considerations, and I'll talk fast. Again, we've only got a half an hour. You know, get started in the fall. Right now is going to be the perfect time to get this thing rolling. Uh, you know, maybe plant a pollinator mix around. I've not done that, but I know there's some research on soybeans that shows that if you plant a pollinator mix around the soybean field to attract those pollinators, uh, you get an increased yield in soybeans. So, uh, and you can make the garden look really nice. Add organic matter to it, uh, any kind of organic matter, don't care what it is. Uh, I have people from the office here that go out on lunch break and when they get done eating their banana, they throw their banana peel over into the, into the garden. It's all organic matter, it all breaks down to, to nutrients. If you're skeptical, just try a small portion. Uh, you know, don't, don't go all in on anything. I, that's my recommendation for anything that we try. Um, there's never mud there. It's, it's just a firm, clean walking surface because we have, we have that soil structure in place. Um, transitioning from a tilled seed bed, you know, I think if you start in the fall and you do what we're talking about, you're in pretty good shape. If you want to start in the spring, we should probably talk a little bit more about maybe how to do that because your soil is already going to be that compacted uh, striated layers of, uh, of soil. And so we need to kind of break that up a little bit, um, maybe before we just jump into this thing. Issues, slugs, everybody likes to bring up slugs, especially in production ag. There are some people around that have slug issues, uh, no doubt, but it's usually very far and few between. And it always seems like it's always the same people. I don't know if it's, because they're in a foggy area, so they have more moisture. I don't, I don't know what the issue is, but Typically, either have them or you don't. Uh, I've, I've not ever really had a slug issue with a, with a three or four years that I've done it. Uh, weeds just means you don't have enough mulch down. If you see weeds, uh, either cover them with more mulch or pull them and you know, just throw them on top of the, of the mulch that you already have and, and use them for mulch. Uh, and again, what is a weed? Is it really a problem? Um, one, one quick note uh, with, with weed beds. So every time you till the soil, you bring up a new weed bed. So so weed seeds can only germinate five times the thickness of the seed. So if you think about that in the seed, you can almost barely see. It can only be in the soil five times that depth or it can't germinate. So if you quit tilling, all those seeds, at least in the first year or two, are going to germinate. You're going to kill them by pulling them, spraying them. I don't care how you, pull, how you kill them, but you're going to kill them. Um, at that point in time, if you don't till again, there are no weed seeds there. I mean, none is obviously an exaggeration, but there's very few weed seeds to ever grow again. If you till that every year, you have a, no, a whole new weed bed every single year that you have to deal with. Mice and moles, again, with slugs, I, I hear people talking that that should be an issue. I've not had an issue. Community gardens, what better way to do a community garden than this way? Most community gardens that I hear of have a really hard time getting people to come in and do any work, but they all wanna show up when it's time to harvest. Uh, and this takes no work. So the perfect match if, if you have a community garden and you're struggling to maybe get people to come in. Facts I throw in for people that I use for my children uh, when I go to school is, uh, you know, how many organisms are in one teaspoon of really good soil? 
um, because we're we have a lack of time here. Um, it's usually eight to nine billion. So there's as many organisms in one teaspoon of really good soil than there are people that live on the face of the planet, if you can think about that. So that's a that's a pretty amazing fact to me. Worms are your greatest ally. Find out how many worms you've got. Dig up your soil, you know, especially in the middle of the year, toward the end of the year. Um, you know, how many, how many worms can you find? They're they're part of your infiltration process to get water into the ground. One percent increase in soil soil organic matter can hold up to twenty five thousand gallons more water. Now, in some years, that's not a big deal, but this year, you know, the more soil organic matter you had, the more water your soil holds, the less watering you have to do, and you can get to a drought like that. Um, turn my volume down. So this is how we did our garden. Uh, you can see that you know the garden from the year before is laying there in the rows. We just we just threw everything in a pile. So there's fruit there vegetables there. Uh, we threw some manure on top of that and we rolled out the hay. And we're done. The only thing we're going to do from here on is plant and harvest. And that's it. Um, so it's very quick uh, and, and very little time to do that. Um, I don't know how to stop videos in this, so we'll just let it play anyway. We're, we're, we have a little bit of lack of time anyway, but if you can see here, let me see if I can stop it real quick. So on the left, we're going to have uh, corn silage ground that has been tilled every year. It's very good soil. Some of the best in Bradford County, it's Pope. Um, but it's been tilled every year and we plant corn onto it. The one on the right is a no-till corn silage field that has been no-tilled and cover crop for 25 years. And it's a Volusia soil, which is kind of heavy upland soil that doesn't drain very well. Um, so these are rainfall simulators from NRCS. We pour equal amounts of water in the top. It rains down on the soil and you can see the difference in what happens. And so again, I'm doing it for commercial ag, but this is gonna happen in your garden too. So I challenge people that when you go out and water your garden, you know, take a spade with you when you get on watering, you know, dig up a little area in your garden and see how much actually went into the soil. Because there's a pretty good chance that most of it has just ran off instead of going down in here into your groundwater where it should be going. Um, so pretty, pretty telling video, uh, again, especially in uh, production ag. So what does your garden look like? What does your soil look like? And, and I don't mean above ground, you know, get, a, get the shovel out, dig into it. How many earthworms do you have? How many other bugs and soil life do you have? How does it smell? It should have a good earthy smell. I had my wife throw away a whole bunch of dryer sheets um, for hunting purposes that were supposed to smell like earth. And I said, where did they go? And she said, I threw them out. They smelled like mold and mildew. And I'm like, that's right. That's what they're supposed to smell like. Um, so good soil should have a really good earthy smell to it. Again, next time you water it, get a shovel or spade out and see where that water went. Uh, temperatures, you know, how hot is your soil? They've had some pretty astounding um, trials where they put thermometers on top of the soil. And they found that it gets to be like 125 degrees. Uh, you know, plants don't like that. Soil life sure doesn't like that. It dries it out more. There's just a lot of problems, even with just um, how hot the soil gets. So with this kind of gardening, you're, the sun is not going to be on hitting the soil really hard. And so that's going to keep everything cooler. Experiment with things. Do things the experts tell you won't work because sometimes they do most of the time they do for whatever reason I, I can't explain it. I've only done this for less than five years but I've seen some pretty amazing things happen um, if you're doing a raised bed most people put down a, a layer of uh, fabric or plastic and then they put the raised bed on top of it well then your so soil biology can't get in so I would make the argument that you know we shouldn't really be doing that um, you know let that biology in if it's a raised bed where it's not connected to the soil below it. You know, maybe you buy some worms or pluck some worms and throw into it. The soil biology is your best friend. What is a weed? Does it matter if it's there? Could it even be beneficial? Again, if it's that flower I showed you, it's a pollinator plant. So let them grow, let, let them bring in the pollinators. What's its life cycle? If it's a winter annual, it's not gonna compete with your crops anyway because they're, they're going out of their life cycle as the garden stuff is coming into its life cycle. So they're gonna be gone. Could it actually improve things? Cover crop research shows, 
you know, there's only about 10% of the time where there's actually a negative yield effect when we're putting cover crops into a cornfield underneath it. Um, and they're growing simultaneously. Uh, 50% of the time, there's no change. And 35%, there's actually a yield increase. And that's with a lot of what most people would call weeds in your cornfield. You know, that's just not one or two here and there. And we're actually getting a yield increase out of some of that. Plant late. This is a thing that took me two or three years to learn. The first year I did it, June, what I say, 19th. The next year I thought, boy, if we had a good garden that year, we're really going to have a good garden this year because I'm going to do it really early. And we're going to get out there, you know, the middle of May. And it did nothing, nothing for the first three or four weeks. I, I thought it was a complete disaster. And then all of a sudden it was like somebody flipped a light switch and they just started going nuts. Um, but it didn't do anything for the first three weeks. So I personally will not ever plant before I, I arbitrarily picked the date of June 12th, you know, whenever. But you do have to plant late. So I use dead vegetation. So I'm using hay. Uh, mostly. Uh, you can use some straw, you can use some other things. If you really get into soil health, what they want you to do is have a living plant growing in that soil 365 days a year. So I have a counterpart that plants cover crops just like they plant in, in the corn fields and in the soybean fields. Uh, and so this is what she did. And so this is the one to your right was planted. I, I don't know the exact dates, but I'm going to say, you know, uh, the very end of August. This one, the middle, the middle was planted in the middle of September, and the one on the end was planted maybe the end of September. And so you can see how much of a difference timing makes, uh, even in garden. So, so get it in as, as early as you can. Uh, the reason I don't do it this way, again, I, I like to call it lazy gardening. Uh, this is a lot of work, in my opinion. Um, so you have to wait till the cover crop blossoms, then you cut it all down, you, you lay it just like she's laying it down, you dig through it, you plant your plants in it, and, and away you go. Um, just a lot of work, in my opinion, um, to, to cut all that stuff down. But again, if you like working in the garden, I will fully admit that probably having a live plant growing in that 365 days a year is probably way better than having dead vegetation that you're using. But, but that's what I use. Uh, and that's it. Awesome. So... I don't know if you want to come back on for questions or if I'm supposed to figure out. Yeah, with my no, I'm, I'm going to read you. To yep, I'm going to read you the questions, Kevin. We have a couple of questions that came in. Most of them you answered as you were going through your presentation. But um, so the first one was how thick was the hay layer? And you mentioned that it was 12 inches is what you guys put down. Um, and did you plant seeds or plants? Nothing. <laughs> right. So, but when you do question plant, and answer. Yeah, when you do plant. How thick was the hay layer? And did you plant seeds or plants directly into it? So that's a question I always get, Wendy. Um, thank you. So if you have weeds growing in your garden, it means you didn't put the mulch on thick enough. So what we recommend is that you start with about, if you're doing, doing it in the fall, you're going to start with a good foot of mulch. By spring, that foot will be six inches. And then again, being the, doing it the lazy way, yes, I just separate the mulch. I dig just a big enough hole to put the plant. I'm, I'm using live plants. I just put the plant in and I go to the next one. And that's all I do. Put the mulch back up around it a little bit and move on to the next one. Um, if that mulch again goes away too quickly, then you'll start to see weeds. So pull the weeds and, and put even more mulch on. But the problem people have with this whole thing, if they have any problem, is they think, you know, three or four inches of mulch in the fall is enough, and it's not even close. So start with 12. It'll go to five or six. You'll be in good shape. Seeds I don't use because, again, just, just takes more time and more effort. But what my mentor does uh, that helped me with this whole thing is, so he will part the, the, the mulch. He will get to bare soil. He might scrape it just a little bit like you normally would with any garden. He'll sprinkle the seeds on top, and then he'll either put a little bit of soil over top of them, or he has peat moss, and he'll drizzle a little bit of peat moss on top of it. And then he'll actually take the, the mulch and put it back over top of it. Just you, you can't put too much over top of it, right? Because that's what you're trying to do is stop weed growth. But he'll put just enough mulch over top of it to, to control the weeds as much as he can, but yeah, still let the sun shine in enough to get those seeds to sprout. So 
that's what I would recommend is pull the mulch back, ruffle, ruffle up the dirt a little bit, you know, just to, to get some, some good uh, soil to seed contact, put your seeds on and then uh, either pack it in a little bit or uh, uh, cover it with a little bit of soil or peat moss. And then you should be able to do that. Uh, do you reapply the hay annually? Yes, absolutely. Again, the, the key to the whole process is lots and lots and lots of mulch. Um, so you do have to put that on annually. Uh, do you plant your cover crop in seeds or plants? So the cover crop, I don't do it that way again. Uh, she plants seeds. So you, again, you probably, um, I don't, it's a good question because I don't know how she does it. That's one thing I've never asked her because if you have a good layer of mulch still there, how do you plant the seeds of cover crop? into that same bed if there's a whole bunch of mulch there. Um, so I would need to ask her that. I, I unfortunately don't have the answer to that. Somehow you'd have to get those seeds down in there. So I don't know if she peels that back, um, kind of kind of goes over a little bit maybe with, a, again, I, I don't want to till, but maybe ruffle that, that soil up just a little bit and then spread the seeds on and put the mulch back on would be a guess, but I, I don't, I can't answer that one very well, unfortunately, so. Uh, what are the impacts of the jumping worm? Are you taking any action against that critter? <laughs> uh, no, I've heard about it. And that's as far as, uh, as my knowledge of that whole thing goes. So I don't know if they're here. I don't know if they've done anything to us. Um, maybe I need to look more into it. I, I hate to keep, you know, reemphasizing this, but I'm, I'm not a gardener. And so uh, I'm not in the garden long enough to even know if, they're even there. So uh, this year we had broccoli, cauliflower, and I had some notes here. Do I remember what the other one is? Something else where they just kept getting eaten to the ground. Now, even now they're still trying to grow, but they just kept be getting eaten right to the base. They're still trying to grow. They're probably four inches tall right now, but uh, I don't know what's after them. I, I think I have a good enough fence up that's keeping the, the mammals out, but it, it could be something like that. Uh, I just don't spend enough time in the garden uh, to know. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't answer that one. I, I don't know. All right. Kevin, thank you so much. Um, Any other questions or comments? I see Go Alfred, so yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that if anyone else has a question, feel free to pop it into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, Kevin has both of those up. I guess it's all yours, Emily, unless somebody else has something else. All right. And with that, I will. They all left me. <laughs> um, actually, let's see here. I think Kevin just has his volume down. I'm trying to think of any other questions I usually get, but a lot of it just boils down to the amount of mulch. The One of the original people, if you go on YouTube or something, her name was Ruth Stout. S-T-O-U-D-T, -T, I believe. Um, she was kind of the original person. The, the videos are very poor because they've probably been done in the 1950s. Um, oh, okay. Yep, you're right. Probably you're right. I turned it down for the videos. My bad. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> no problem. No problem, Kevin. I realized after a second, I'm like, oh, I don't think you can hear us. <laughs> yep, that's what it was. Yeah. So Ruth Stout, actually, um, just real quick, she planted her potatoes. She had the mulch down. And she planted her potatoes. She'd take a potato and she just walked around in the video I see. And she walked around in the garden and she cut the potato and flipped it, cut the potato and flipped it, cut the potato and flipped it, cut the potato and flipped it. And her potatoes were planted. So that's kind of how easy it can be. So, yep, you're right. I turned the, the, the noise down so I could get through those videos and talk during them. And I forgot completely about turning it back up. No problem. No problem at all. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation and some very excited. I'm excited and I'm going to going to try some of those those uh, options out. So I am a lazy gardener as well. Um, but <laughs> but if there's no other questions, um, we just wanted to thank you for for kicking us off for Watershed Wednesday uh, next week. For those who would like to join us. Um, Matt and Ian are going to be here talking about estimating nutrient loads due to stream bank erosion. So feel free to pop in on Wednesday morning at 9.30 a.m. And uh, we'll be excited to share that. But Kevin, thank you again for a fantastic presentation. And we hope that everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.